All right, everyone. We are now broadcasting live. This is Legally Speaking. Good morning, Google+. Plus. Uh, this is Legally Speaking, as Stephen Futerall just pointed out. This is a Hangout on Air featuring lawyers and other legal professionals, and actually anyone who we think might help lawyers. So maybe SEO professionals, branding, marketing. We're planning on featuring a variety of people, but the focus will be on lawyers. And we're going to try to provide some helpful, basic legal information along the way. Um, we will also take legal comments uh, or legal questions by way of comment if you have any. And we, another thing we're planning are some topical roundtable discussions where we'll have groups of lawyers discussing areas of, of in, practice areas that we think might interest uh, general, the general public and, and maybe answer some questions you have. Uh, one thing a lot of non-lawyers might not know about Google Plus is that Google Plus is filled with lawyers. They're just they're bursting at the seams. There are so many that I can't even keep track, even though I'm quite active on Google Plus. And so I thought Google Plus just gives us such an amazing opportunity to connect with them on a more personal level. And so we're excited to be doing that. And one one of the things I wanted to do before we launched into the show fully is to thank Christine DeGraff, who has featured me in a 31 People project she's doing this month. I, I encourage you to follow her in that project if you're not already doing so. But she and, and her uh, co-host, Mia, Mia Voss, have given me inspiration and confidence to, to really launch this program, so I thank them. But without further ado, I want to introduce my co-host, who is Charleston, uh, South Carolina attorney, Stephen Futerall. Stephen Futerall, I found to be, <laughs> he's here. Uh, I found him to be a true Southern gentleman, a very nice guy. He's funny. He's a former law professor. Um, he's been practicing for almost 20 years. He practices in the areas of criminal defense, family law, and personal injury. Uh, he's just recently published a new book on family law. Um, he's also produced an iPad app for jury selection, so he's technically very savvy. He is a web designer of sorts, and he's just, he's an all-around uh, very knowledgeable guy in, in many areas, so he's going to be able to contribute lots of good information. So how are you doing this morning, Stephen? I am doing wonderfully. Good to see you, <laughs> Tina, and, and thank you. Flattery will get you absolutely <laughs> everywhere. I know okay? this, yes. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, real excited to be here. Uh, uh, thank everybody who is joining us live. Uh, this being our first broadcast of Legally Speaking, we've got some good speakers lined up um, for you throughout the coming months and an excellent uh, attorney from Philadelphia this morning, Brian Fishman. Uh, Tina, you want to introduce Brian? Sure, sure. More about Brian and more, more from me here. Uh, Brian and I, Brian became a, an early and quick friend of mine on Google+. He, is, he has been very charming and engaging, not just with me, but when I read his comments to other people, it always just warms your heart a little bit to hear from Brian. Not only that, but he's, he's another guy who, who, when he speaks about the law, you know he knows what, what he's talking about. He's also been able to take his practice to a new level by way of social media, and so he, he early on was telling me about some of the things he's done on social media. We got to know each other um, by way of comments, and then we took it to, to PMs where, where we discussed our practice and our lives a little bit, and he's just a super nice guy. Um, I was very excited early on because when I was brand new to Google Plus he featured me in his daily newspaper. It was like the biggest <laughs> thing that's ever happened in my whole life. So that was exciting and then he, he was so active on Google Plus that I actually formed a, a community in his honor, the, <laughs> the Google Plus Addiction Recovery and Support Group, which uh, Carolyn, a friend of mine, Carolyn Capern and Greg Trulio, who are also SEO people, folks on SEO, I met with them for lunch and they thought that was actually, Brian, they actually thought that was a real chemical dependency group, um, <laughs> and, which I have nothing against that, but that just really wasn't the point. And that, it, it's kind of an empty community, but anyone's welcome to come along and we, you know, play fun with ourselves about how addicted we are to Google Plus. But anyway, the last thing I would say about Brian is that he's a he's a criminal defense attorney. He stays busy. He's often commenting about being in prison and and also being in the courthouse. 
Yeah, so, Tina, that, yeah, yeah. Being, in, being in prison, <laughs> that, that didn't come out right. Cool. But yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I, I just think it's cool. Um, but we did steal him away from both of those places today, so we're super excited. And so, Brian, how are you doing, my Welcome, friend? Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love the applause. Uh, <laughs> you got double applause uh, on Yeah, that. Steve and Tina, it's great to be with you guys. I am uh, honored to be the uh, the uh, first guest on Legally Speaking, or as Tina told me, the guinea pig. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think I like the honorary, first honorary guest better. Uh, but no, it's great to be with you guys. Um, I've commented and engaged with both of you on Google+. Plus. Uh, extensively over the past, you know, three, four months. So to actually be speaking to you, hearing your voices, seeing your faces, um, moving as opposed to just a mugshot, um, speaking of prisons, uh, is great. So th th I'm looking forward to this whole thing. And I'm usually, by the way, on the right side of the uh, the, uh, the prison bars when I go to the prisons. In fact, I spell it out when I'm at home on the weekends and I'm going to the prisons. I just say to my wife, I'm going to the PRIs today. And then my kids say, where are you going? I said, I oh, daddy has to go to work because they don't need to hear that daddy's going to prison. Yeah, yeah that's so. a good point. That's yeah. a very good point. Yeah, yeah I should have mentioned that. I thought Except anyone... I thought anyone listening would know if you're a lawyer, you probably aren't behind the bars. But yeah, no, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, well, always. Yeah, my kids are getting to that age where they're starting to spell. So, so you got to be careful what you say because you start saying P R I S O N, and they say you're going to prison, Dad. You know, <laughs> you know, Brian. I I visit prisons on occasion myself as a lawyer, not not a uh, potential resident. And there's nothing <laughs> more refreshing than walking out of prison. Uh, it's sort of a reaffirmation that uh, no matter how bad your day is going. Walking out of a prison from seeing a client in there, everything's a okay. Everything. Exactly. You see that sun? Yeah. It could be raining. It doesn't matter. The fact that you're looking up at the sky is a good thing. Yeah. It's really, um, it's really weird. I've actually only been to prison a few times because I don't do criminal defense, and I don't mean on the right side <laughs> of the bars. During law school, I think we had a we had a trip there, which was really weird because the prisoners will heckle women who come who come through there, and that was a strange experience. And then I did have one guy who who was in jail once, and I went through and got all had to sign up and everything. But it, it's pretty scary. I don't know. I I, I didn't like the feeling. Um, Brian, uh, while we're on the topic of prison and criminals, uh, would you like to tell us a little, uh, tell our viewers a little bit more? Uh, about your practice areas. You know, we know that you're a criminal lawyer in uh, in Philly, but what all does that encompass? Um, I thought you said in Chile. I said in, uh, in South <laughs> in South America. <laughs> I'd love to be a I'd love to be a criminal lawyer in Chile. Um, yeah, it's funny because when uh, Tina was introducing you, I'm actually sort of right up the same, um, right really in the same wheelhouse. Criminal defense is definitely my main practice area, and, and I would say that you know, probably 90 percent, um, you know, 85, 90 percent. But I do do some personal injury. I do do some um, family law. Um, naturally, with criminal law, I do some civil rights work if it comes in as far as, you know, excessive force and police brutality, excessive force by corrections officers and things like that, just because it's sort of a natural, um, you know, focus point that uh, transitions well from from criminal defense clients, obviously. Uh, if you think you have somebody who was, you know, maliciously prosecuted and, and there was excessive force used against them and then they're charged with assault or something of that nature on police and you beat the case, uh, they're found not guilty, and, and they've got some extensive injuries. You know, there very well may be a, 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 a you know, a, a civil, you know, civil rights matter there. So I do some of that. Um, again, uh, as far as the criminal work that I do, it's mostly state work. I do. Uh, I am admitted in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania to do uh, federal work, um, uh, but the majority of my work is in state court in Philadelphia, and then in the surrounding counties. There's sort of the five county area, which is Montgomery, Bucks, Delaware, uh, and Chester counties around Philadelphia. Um, and most of my stuff is really you know, blue collar. Uh, you know, I don't do a lot of white collar. Um, you know. Um, Criminal work, much and, more street crimes. 
Um, Brian, uh, we've got uh, some questions coming in here. Um, oh, cool! Yeah, Super oh yeah. Exciting. And, uh, I, I can't you know, see. I can't see them, and I can't see who might be present. But, um, but we're going to switch. I don't, see, I don't see. I don't see them either. But the fact that people are watching and asking <laughs> questions is a plus. Woo yeah, I, I don't yeah. know that I can multitask as well as I should. Uh, unfortunately, Jeffrey uh, Lapine is uh, uh, questioning, saying he needs a link to get in. Uh, oh no! Yeah, if I leave the screen, I may never come back again. So, oh no! Uh, uh, but uh, he's hopefully, he's, I think he's in a, Jeffrey's. I think he's in a Vegas casino. Yeah, yeah exactly. So he hopefully he's probably just making an excuse. He really just wants to be gambling and stuff. Yeah, right probably. So uh, <laughs> I think he just wants a tauntino. I yeah. I would not be surprised. All right. So <laughs> on the subject of your practice no, okay, area. On the subject of your practice area, we've got a question here from a good buddy of yours. Jason Dunkel asks, uh, are you a former prosecutor? And if so, how long and where? Jason Dunkel, I'm glad to see that you have joined the event. I knew that you were a, uh, a strong maybe, so uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for being, a, first of all, for being a great friend. Um, Jason Dunkel was one of my first uh, friends on Google Plus. Uh, he's about three, four hours from me in State College. He's an excellent attorney. Uh, he's a very giving and selfless individual, and uh, I'm glad to have met him on Google Plus, and I, and I can't wait to actually meet him in person one day. Um, but in answering his question, yes, I was a prosecutor. I was uh, out of law school. I graduated in 2001 from Temple University here in Philadelphia. I went immediately to the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. Uh, I had interned there as a second year summer associate. I got a job there out of law school. All my friends went to big firms making uh, six figures, and I think I started at like 32000 uh, at the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. I worked there from 2001 to 2005, so for four years I was a prosecutor. Um, I handled, uh, we worked in our municipal court where you would practice preliminary hearings and uh, misdemeanor trials such as DUIs, possession of narcotics, retail thefts, you name it, misdemeanor wise. And then as you go on you sort of move through the different divisions. I practiced in the juvenile court, so I dealt with adjudicated uh, juvenile delinquents and things of that nature. Uh, I then started practicing bench trials in our uh, felony waiver program where um, Philadelphia, just due to the volume of cases, has sort of a felony waiver track and a major trial track. So the felony waivers are for sort of lower level felony cases where um, the client always has a right to do a, a demand a jury if they wish, but they try to get rid of these sort of lower level felonies with bench trials. Um, and then ultimately I was in the uh, family violence and sexual assault unit where I prosecuted um, child abuse, uh, both physical and sexual, um, sexual assault cases and rape cases of, of adults, as well as just um, domestic uh, physical abuse and violence. So it, it, was, a, it was an amazing experience um, and one that got me in the courtroom right out of law school, got me trying cases in front of judges, dealing with police officers and witnesses, and, and really, um, you know, helped to launch you know my career as a as a as a litigator and a trial attorney. That that Brian, that sounds like excellent excellent experience. Never never worked in the prosecutor's office myself, but definitely would have loved to do that just to get that different perspective on criminal law. So very interesting stuff. Me either. I started in the I did the big firm track, which I, I learned a lot, but but mostly you just sit behind a computer and do and do lots of writing really. So. I'm jealous, but maybe, yeah, maybe it it'll rub cool. off on me a little bit. <laughs> so, but, well, I, one of the things I wanted to do I think is important in the show is to, to break this down for non-lawyers into some, to some more basic information, but I was thinking of, well, we were thinking of maybe asking you what frequently asked questions you get by clients, but also just maybe someone who... Possibly, I'm, I'm guessing many of the people watching may never, hopefully have never been in, in trouble with the law, but, you know, good things happen, or, or bad things happen to good people, and so if someone just found, finds themselves somehow dealing with a, a police officer, maybe stopped for DUI, hopefully not, but New Year's coming up or, or something, what would be your advice to maybe a first-time offender or someone caught up somehow getting in contact with the police, what, what would you tell them? 
Well, I think any criminal defense attorney, and Stephen can back me up on this, and Jason and, and others, um, you know, number one rule is do not speak. Um, hmm. You can only get yourself in trouble. Now, that's not to say, you know, you use the example of DUI. There are certain obligations you have, you know, in Pennsylvania and I'm sure in other states with what's called the implied consent law where, you know, you have to answer some basic questions. You know, you have to give them your license and registration and insurance and things of that nature. You can't have just no conversation with someone. But you should not make any admissions to any sort of wrongdoing. Uh, and I know it's, you know, if you ever... Uh, read police discovery on a DUI, for example. The guys always had two beers. It's unbelievable. Why Whether, is that? Yeah, why is that? It's always, <laughs> always two beers. No they, could, they, could be a, they could be a point oh three, or they could be a point two six, and they've had two beers, right, Stephen? Uh, absolutely, every time, right, two, right, two. Right, so, so that's an example. Don't... So that, wait, there's no two beer defense? I mean, you must... <laughs> Yes. You know what? There is a two-beer defense if it was the truth. There is, if that oh, was yeah. the truth. Because if they only had two beers, they wouldn't be uh, a point, you know, two five, uh, gotcha. and nearly comatose. So, I mean, the number one thing is... I don't know. If I drink two beers, I might be. Does well, it, you know, listen, I'm not going to get into body weight. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, you know, it, it, the, the bottom line is don't, don't talk. You're not doing yourself any favors. These guys are going to try to promise you, and, and in more serious cases, when you're actually taken into the um, the station and detectives try to talk to you and say, look, you know, you can get out of here real easy. We can make your bail lower. You know, we can make this go away. Just tell us this. Just tell us that. Um, all, I, I tell everybody, the Commonwealth or in, in Pennsylvania, the prosecutor's office has to use evidence to convict you. If you talk... That's additional evidence. Even if you're denying what uh, what they're saying you did, it's still additional evidence because I've had clients who have denied it, but then they go on to talk and they tell a story that just doesn't line up with the physical evidence or the other facts of the case, and they end up using your denial even against you because it's so clear that you're lying, and therefore if you're lying, you must have really done it. So it just doesn't serve the client any purpose to talk to law enforcement. So I, I think it's the number one piece of advice that any you know, criminal defense lawyer would give to anybody, and, and that's the advice I have. Uh, yeah, yeah, if I may jump in, that that is probably the number one advice. I agree 100%. And you know, people want to be helpful. They want to answer the questions of law enforcement. They think they're being disrespectful if they don't if they don't talk and, and answer these things, and more often than not, Brian, I'm sure you see this too, they think they can talk their way out of it. That's a, a half the time what they're trying to do is, if I'm friendly enough and I start sharing all these details, they're going to let me go. Do you see a lot of that too? Absolutely. And when, I, when, and when you ask them, why did you say this and why did you say that, that's inevitably their response or, you know, that's their thought process. If I start sort of cross-examining them in my office, did you think that they were going to lower your bail? Did you think maybe they wouldn't charge you? And, you know, and, 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 and then they're sitting in my office charged. So I try to say to them, well, where did it get you? Now you're sitting in my office with charges pending against you. So, you know... I, there's, I, tell, I tell clients, there's nothing wrong with, you don't have to be disrespectful. You don't have to be aggressive. You don't have to say, you know, F you pig, I'm not saying anything. You know? <laughs> yeah, we hope they don't say that, right? But you can say, you know, I, I'm exercising my right to remain silent. You know, I'm exercising my right to remain silent. You know, sir, you know, if you're going to arrest me, officer, you have to do what you have to do, but I have nothing to say to you. I mean, you don't have to be disrespectful. You don't have to be aggressive or anything like that. Just simply not say anything and let them know that you know your rights and you're not going to talk. Uh, uh, Brian, we have another question from your uh, our buddy, Jason Dougal, uh, Dunkel, uh, and it says... <laughs> He's <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah. Hi, Jason. Yeah. Here you go. Uh, Jason's question is, but won't the cops give you a cooperation discount when you're honest and implicate yourself? <laughs> uh, Jason, I, 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 I think we can all answer I that question. I think Stephen can answer this yeah. one. Yeah. Steven, Jason, first of all, I want to thank Jason for laying these softballs up to me so I can knock him out of the park. <laughs> yeah, right. Actually, I think what you're saying applies even in, in civil cases. I mean, the problem is that clients often think that they can, by something they say, they can either persuade the judge, the other lawyer, uh, in your case, I guess, the cops, 
um, of something and they don't understand that what we do as lawyers to get information isn't just that we have all this stuff just sitting in our brain and we know everything that ever happened in the world but there's there's actually evidence there are documents there are people and and other lawyers will contact those people they're investigators and so we do digging to find information and it's just anything that they say we just use to go it's just basically the starting point for our map to go find more information so it's 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 never helpful and, and the other thing big pet peeve of mine and all lawyers is anyone who thinks they're trying to DIY uh, the law or you you're representing them and but they still kind of think for you and there, it's, there's a reason we went to law school uh, for a bunch of years and, and read books how thick were they? I don't know. Um, uh, and studied hard to learn. The law is really complicated, and so. Uh, yeah, and the one thing I'll say, just to follow up on Jason's point, it, and I think Stephen, you know, doing criminal work, um, I know Tina doesn't doesn't really practice in the criminal area, and I think that um, uh, Stephen will agree with me here is that if you have information, um, I tell my clients keep that ace in the back of your pocket for when they do charge you. Um, because they're not going to give you any discount when you give them the information for free. If you admit that you did everything up front or you have information maybe about another crime and you tell them all that information, well, they don't owe you anything. And they're not going to say that they promised you anything to get you to talk because now all of a sudden the, the, the statement is potentially coerced and inadmissible in court. So, you know, if you do have information or you're going to be cooperative, don't do it up front, like you said, Tina, DIY. Don't do it yourself. Say nothing. Let the police arrest you. Let them charge you. Then come see me. Come see Stephen. Come see Jason. See an attorney, a criminal attorney, who will say, you know, look, this case is really bad. You know, they've got all this evidence against you. They got fingerprints. They've got ballistics. Whatever it is. And then the guy says, well, listen, you know, I know something about, you know, a shooting that just occurred or a homicide or I can, I can leave them to the guy that, you know, put me up to this or I can leave them up the chain of, of, the, of the drug circle. You know, now a lot of guys don't like to snitch and there's that whole thing, you know, within criminal law and especially that's a big thing in Philadelphia. But my whole point is don't give them the information for free. You hold that in your back pocket and maybe down the road you can use information that you have to benefit yourself as far as sentencing uh, or charges you have to plead to or things of that nature down the road. That's great uh, advice. Brian, we have, uh, while you're talking about giving information away, uh, we have another question here from uh, a viewer, uh, Nahar. Moapatra asks you, can our post comments, any other activities at Google Plus be used as evidence in any legal cases if related? That is an excellent question and the answer is unequivocally yes, your comments can be used against you and I have found that as much as we all love social media uh, and we've all become friends on it and we have all become addicted to it as Tina's a community that she created for me uh, attest to. Um, there are more problems that have been come, become created with social media and criminal law uh, that it's, it's, it's really, it's a new place for detectives to go. In other words, you have somebody who, who commits some awful crime, I mean literally a homicide, and they just checked in on Facebook, you know, at a McDonald's oh a block gosh. away. I mean, oh, no. it, it, it sounds it sounds like why would somebody do that? But they just people don't connect the two things. You know, they've got their social world and their social media world, and then they've got what they're doing in the real world. You know, you know, in reality, and they don't think that people are going to go online, um, or if they do, they just don't. It's just it's not connected in our brains yet for some reason. But you've got people posting things on Instagram. Um, you know, uh, you've got people posting comments on Facebook, on Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, whatever it is. Those, you know, when you put it out there, you lose any expectation of privacy in it. You're putting it out on a public forum. I mean, you know, we've we've seen those. Um, we saw that Instagram picture. I think it was in Florida. That that girl took a picture of herself and wrote "too too drunk to care," and then she yeah, got the wrong way of the highway. Terrible. That was a Twitter thing. Yeah. Uh, Twitter, and she and she ended up killing uh, two or three people, four people, I think. You know. Mm -hmm. So right there, she essentially confessed to it. We saw the case the gentleman in Ohio uh, who admitted to um, killing the guy on the YouTube video. 
Um, and people were wondering whether or not that was sort of a ploy, you know, to sort of get it off his conscience and to try to curry favor eventually when he pled guilty. But, you know, again, stay off of social media when it comes to anything, law, you know, criminally related, law related. It, 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 you're only, and, you're, you're only digging a hole for yourself. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's going into that community I have that says the gene pool needs, <laughs> more, it needs chlorine. more chlorine. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So, well, and, and I would add, really, I'm so, I'm so obsessive when I'm dealing with my cases that even, even posting something completely unrelated to your case on Facebook gives us a time when you are in front of a computer, which may not be relevant, but it could be relevant. And so I would just prefer my clients to completely disconnect their, their lives from social media entirely during yeah. but, but certainly not mention anything because I, they I don't realize. I've told clients to delete their Instagram. I mean, right now, you know, like Facebook is like, uh, you know, as the kids say, so last season. Instagram is now like the big thing these days with with younger people. Google Plus is getting, you know, I think bigger. Um, I tell them to do, uh, YouTube. I tell them to, to delete their accounts, but I really can't convince them to do it. Um, and, and so, if they're not going to do that, I just tell them, just keep it about your personal life. Don't talk about anything that would, you know, in, in any way implicate yourself. And like you said, Tina, sometimes someone thinks they're not implicating themselves, but they are just merely by like, you know, again, like I said, checking in at McDonald's, yes, that's that there's nothing guilty right. about that. But if it's right next to the crime scene, you know, people put yeah. two and two together. So uh. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think we're it looks like we're we're running we're we're getting into some time uh, yeah. here. Our, our format may go well beyond 15 minutes here. We can kind of schedule for that, but guess what? Nobody's cutting us off at this point, so uh, I guess we could just, uh, unless somebody has to take a coffee break uh, or our audience has a very small attention span. Uh, uh, Brian, I think the uh, what we wanted to also ask you about is uh, get a sense for some of the things that are trending uh, legally in your neck of the woods. I, I remember, for example, I saw a post that you had done and it was uh, a video of you uh, arguing in, in front of your state Supreme Court, I believe it was, which I wish we videoed it the same way. By the way, uh, not to blow smoke up your skirt, but great presentation there. But in terms of what's legally trending, it can be technology, uh, latest legislation in your state. What, what's trending there for you? Well, on, on the legislative, first of all, thank you. Uh, as you said, flattery will get you everywhere. Uh, <laughs> and coming from a law professor and a legal scholar like yourself, um, I appreciate that. The only reason that was actually on video was because it was it was in front of our state's superior court, um, and it was an en banc uh, argument that the, uh, the Commonwealth had requested, the prosecution had requested, after uh, I had gotten an individual's uh, conviction overturned um, with a with a three judge panel of our superior court, uh, so that's why it was videotaped and it was actually on like a local television station here, and, and it, it was it was a lot of I was nervous, but it was a lot of fun doing it, um, and that was on 404b evidence like prior bad acts, which is which is an interesting topic. But as far as trending legislation, it's something that's um, there's a f two things I would point out that are really big in Pennsylvania right now. One is SORNA. The Sexual Offender Registration Notification Act, or, or me, uh, as most people know it is Megan's Law or the Adam Walsh Act. Um, there was a lot of discussion recently that Pennsylvania was going to lose its funding uh, or lose some funding if it didn't get its Megan's Law up to snuff with the federal Adam Walsh Act. So it has recently become extremely, um, in my opinion, draconian and really oppressive. And the problem a lot of people are having is people entered into guilty pleas. Uh, two, five, seven years ago, and they thought they were going to be on Megan's Law for 10 years, and they get a notification from the Pennsylvania State Police that their crime it now requires lifetime reporting, and they've been jumped up to lifetime reporting. So mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been getting a lot of calls about, is this retroactively applied? You know, are judges enforcing this? Can you get off the registry? Am I on for life? So that's a huge one right now. Yeah, ex post fast, uh, facto and that sort of thing. So absolutely, uh, yeah. I threw in some legalese for good measure for doing <laughs> off the audience there. Well, and, uh, and, I said and, it ex post facto. There you go. Yeah, I'll say race ipso loquitur. <laughs> hey, hey guys, can we jump away from the law for a second so we don't lose anyone who's not who's not totally into the law as we are? And I, I actually wanted to ask you a question about how your experiences on social media and Google Plus in particular, and how that's fit into your 
your practice and, and I guess your practice plans, maybe how you interact with clients or anything. I mean, how, what are you doing on social media? Social media has become, um, to me, my main source of, of marketing. It, it really has. Um, and other than, and me and Tina have talked about this before um, in PMs and also even I think publicly, it's, it's, it's essentially free um, with, with the exception of your time. It is very time consuming. And Which yes, is expensive, but exactly. Well, so that, so that's why it's not it's really nice. free. It's not really free. And and, and that's the, the the great thing and the difficult thing about it because uh, I've stepped away from it a little bit recently just because I've been dealing with um, some other issues and I, and I've been busy. But um, you, I think we'll all agree that if you're like on Facebook personally or you're on Google Plus as a lawyer. You can go on to reply to one person's comment, and the next thing you know, you're clicking on another article in their feed, and then you're commenting on that, and then you see some friend of yours that you haven't connected with in a while, and you want to see what they're up to, and the next thing you know, you look up, and two hours have gone by. And, and, <laughs> Absolutely. And you, you know, we all we've all been there, right? And it's you know, you said I'm only going to go on for 15, 20 minutes, and three hours later, it's like, oh my god, I haven't prepped for that case for tomorrow. Yeah. So, so th there's the plus and the minus there. Th that being said. Um, I, I have a blog that uh, I don't really think was getting much attention at all, and suddenly I started, you know, putting it out there on Google Plus, um, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, somewhat, but really on Google Plus. And suddenly I found all these great attorneys, uh, and, and such as yourself, uh, yourselves, and, and Jason, Jeffrey Lappin, who you mentioned from Nebraska, Stephen Sweet from California, David Slepko from Rhode Island, Michael Eline, um, J Jonathan Rosenfeld from Chicago. I mean, the list is too long for me to name all of them, but these are the guys that are popping in my head. They were sort of like my, my core initial group when I first met when I got on Google+. They were sharing my stuff. They were writing comments. And it not only was my stuff now getting traction on Google, but it just it felt good, you know. People were recognizing your work. You put a lot of time into these blog posts, and you, you know, you really want to make sure they're accurate and they're well they're well written. And you know, they're sort of written for the client, like that's the person that needs to be reading the information. But I was getting this great feedback from all of these wonderful attorneys, and it was it was awesome, you know. And it just got me more and more involved in it. Uh, yeah, I definitely have found that uh, Google Plus is so much more collaborative uh, than a lot of other social media. Not not to ignore Twitter and Facebook and so on, but Brian, my no, my yes, experience, to ignore Twitter yeah. and Facebook. <laughs> totally, yeah. they're just dead well, to me. I, I know. I, I mean, I I auto post that way, but yeah, it's just once I <laughs> started getting active, just found that uh, so many of of the lawyers that you mentioned and others are so collaborative and and it is nice to get some feedback and know that other people's are uh, other people are taking notice of, of your posts and commenting and engaging uh, if I can interrupt we've got one other question here from Jason Frasca who oh, asked okay, you cool. the yeah. he's an Evernote consultant and yeah. he is awesome on Google Plus he is yep. amazing if you haven't circled him you should you guys all uh, lawyers should circle Jason Frasca I, I noticed that I am using about a fraction of Evernote's potential since I started reading his posts there. So I'm going to turn into an Evernote uh, geek yeah, here. And, I've been trying. Uh, I just, I, 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 he's got to teach me maybe because I've tried and I know people love it. But I hear he's through awesome. hire. Well, it's <laughs> awesome. You, you can you, because you can have it on every device, and so you can take notes on your phone and just thoughts you're having and stuff like that. And then you know you can of course go online and on tablets and stuff. I, Evernote is wonderful. I had used it quite a bit early on and then I stopped using it but once I started interacting with Jason I've started using it again and I'm, I'm becoming a little bit more productive so that's yeah. a good thing. Jason's question is since uh, you, you do DUI do you recommend taking the breathalyzer or rejecting the option regardless of how many drinks uh, you may have had? Uh, Jason an excellent question um, if I give you uh, good sound advice here, I want some free Evernote advice uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I have had, I've, I've had it on my iPad and my iPhone, and I just I just you know, I take snap pictures of receipts, and then I don't seem to use it. In anything, um, I this is an, an interesting issue because in, in Pennsylvania, and again, I don't I don't know how it is in Florida for you, Tina, or Stephen for you in in South Carolina. 
Um, but in, in Pennsylvania, if you refuse the breath test or you refuse breath, breath or blood, whatever the, the police are asking for, um, PennDOT, which is Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, uh, regardless of whether or not you are convicted in the, in the underlying DUI that you're arrested for, will suspend your license for one year automatically, even if you're found not guilty of the DUI. Ouch. So, yeah. yes. One year. Auto automatic civil penalty of one year license suspension just for the refusal under the implied consent law. What the implied consent law is basically is that by having a driver's license, it's a, it's a, it's a privilege, not a right. And if the police, you know, stop you and they have reasonable suspicion that you may be DUI, you have to perform a, a, a test. And that's to, that's to protect all of us. I mean, we all, we all drive out on these dangerous roads. And it's so you're, you're agreeing, uh, you're, you've consented by having a driver's license to, to uh, give breath or blood. So if you don't, you're looking at a year license suspension in Pennsylvania. Now, I don't know what it is in your jurisdiction. The other thing that happens is if you refuse, they arrest you. Um, they charge you, and then that refusal comes in as what, we, what lawyers usually refer to as consciousness of guilt. In other words, if you weren't um, high or drunk, you would have consented to the test, and therefore uh, that's used against you, and uh, it can have just as devastating an impact as whatever the blood alcohol test uh, was uh, or would have been. So my advice generally is that is that you take the test. Um, now, that being said, that's not the case necessarily in every situation because there are situations, obviously, where you know you're going to be over the legal limit and you can come up with some other explanation as to why you refused it. Your lawyer can uh, be creative and, and try to beat the criminal case and avoid a conviction. Uh, but you, you, you must be aware, at least in Pennsylvania, that there's no way around that one-year license suspension if you refuse. Hey, um, we have uh, a, a question that sort of ties into this, and this is from uh, uh, a social media rock star lawyer, uh, Jeffrey Lapine. Le uh, hey, Jeffrey. it's yeah, Jeffrey. Uh, and, be having him on soon. Yep, yep. First of all, I, pro I, pro I pronounce it Lapin. Is it Lapine? I, I, I saw his Lapine. video, and I think it is Lapine, but I've huh. been engaging with Jeffrey on LinkedIn and Twitter for probably a year or more before I ever explored anything on Google+. Plus. But uh, Jeffrey has a good question. It's a tough one, I think, for us to, to answer. Oh, for those get, of back us to do. Jason, oh, get back to the Jason no. Dunkel yeah, question. Jason, <laughs> oh, well, yeah. he, you know, if I'm reading Jason's <laughs> questions, he wants to know who does your hair. Okay, so, oh, okay. <laughs> no, literally, it's on the list. All right, so getting to the hard-hitting question, though, uh, Jeffrey asks you, uh, how do you balance representing a drunk driver versus the pain, suffering, and damages of a severely injured victim. And for what it's worth, Brian, I kind of take that question along the same veins of, of how do you feel about representing somebody who might be guilty? I get asked that question. Absolutely. In fact, um, it, it's probably the number one question that's, that's asked. And um, Jeffrey, first of all, welcome. Uh, I'm glad you were able to chime in from Vegas. Hopefully you're enjoying it. If this is vacation, you're enjoying it. Uh, Jeff, I want to give a big shout out to you and say thank you for everything you've done for me on Google+. Plus. You've reached out to me personally, and I, and I appreciate everything. Um, with When it comes to criminal law, you really have to separate the emotional part. And again, I think Stephen will probably back me up because he does personal injury and has been on the other side of it where maybe you're defending or, or representing the person who was severely injured by a drunk driver or just a negligent driver. As Jeff, I know you do a lot of personal injury work in Nebraska. Um, it's not about what I personally think about the person's guilt or innocence. I always have clients into come into my office trying to convince me that they're not guilty. And I tell them, listen, I, I want to know the truth. I want to know what happened. I want to see how I can, you, I can, you know, you can provide me information that can help you. Um, this is about, the criminal law is about protecting the Constitution and about protecting people's constitutional rights. And the prosecutor, the state, the Commonwealth, they've got a burden of proof. And it's something that any one of us, if we were sitting at the defense table, not as an attorney, but as the client, we would want those same protections. And this is something that I tell a jury. I mean, I might as well be giving part of my jury opening statement right now. They charged you. Uh, this is how our, um, you know, um, 
justice system was set up. They have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, they have to convince all 12 of you, or if it's a judge, the, the, the judge, the one judge, beyond a reasonable doubt. And, and if they can't, then you have to acquit the person to find them not guilty. And remember, you're not finding a person innocent. When, when a jury says not guilty, they're not saying innocent. They're saying not guilty, and, and there's a difference. Um, so I think that that is how myself as an attorney, um, I don't even want to say reconciles it because I, I see myself as protecting the liberties and the rights and the freedoms of, of myself, of, of Stephen, of Tina, of you, Jeffrey, of, of anyone who's out there listening, and of my clients sitting next to me. So it, it's not about this one individual client. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to sound callous, but I don't really care whether or not they've committed the crime. That's really not an issue. And if you get caught up in, oh my God, this guy, this person's so violent, and this person's done this terrible thing, you know, I, I can't defend this person. You, you're not going to be a successful criminal defense attorney. Yeah, bottom that, line. That those are, uh, you know, to to jump in there. One of the things that I tell jurors, Brian, is that. Uh, we talk about two forms of a verdict, one being, of course, guilty and not guilty. And in closing, oftentimes I'll tell jurors, really, it's about there are, as a practical matter, three forms of a verdict, guilty, not guilty, and not proven. And that's really what we're hanging upon, I think, when we're representing those. And people ask me, how do you do it? if you think they're guilty and I like you look at the system as a whole saying it's not perfect but it is the best system in the world and it doesn't work unless we put that burden on the state to, to prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and that's Absolutely. what it's all about. Yeah, it's a bill of rights and, 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 and you and I, and, and, I mean, there's lawyer, you know, people can't speak for themselves so that's why they hire us to, to, to do the speaking for us and to do the cross-examining for, uh, for them. Well, so that's, um, that's the system. The other uh -oh. thing I would add is that prosecutors may well try to you know, have trumped up charges to where the, the, the thing that they're trying to prosecute for isn't fairly and legitimately under our laws what the person's actually may be done. And so it's our job to make sure to rein that in. And you know, our, our justice system is set up in such a way that you know, we, have, we have strong advocates on both sides for a reason because you know, to assume that prosecutors are always on the up and up and we can't say this maybe during jury instructions but you know, the reality is that, that they may not be fairly um, trying to prosecute this person. And Absolutely. So, um, you, and and, and, and to, that point, to that point, you know, police officers lie. I mean, you know, I, I, there are a lot of great police officers in Philadelphia and all over the country, and you know, I, 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 I you know, respect their service. They're, they do they do dangerous things every day. But listen, they get on the stand and they embellish and they make things fit, you know, uh, what they think is legally correct. Uh, I mean, a perfect example is a motion to suppress drugs, if or or a gun, any any evidence really. But let's just say drugs or a gun. If my client has a gun on him, and he doesn't have a license to carry. He's guilty of the offense. If he's got drugs on him, illegal drugs, he's guilty of the offense. So it's not a, even a matter of guilt or innocence. The question is, did the police violate his right, uh, his expectation of privacy, when they recovered the item? So that's a situation where you're not even talking about guilt or innocence. Um, I admit, I, I hate guns. I, you know, I'm just, I'm not a gun person. Um, but if, but I, but I am a person who believes in a person's expectation of privacy, and I don't believe that police. We, we live in a police state where people can just come up and, and search you for any reason whatsoever and take things off of you. Absolutely. And if they, and, and if they do it wrong, then the the ramification under the exclusionary rule, to throw out another legal term, is the the gun or the drugs are out, and the Commonwealth, the prosecution, can't prove its case, and that's the way it should be. Tina, I've got a question for you. Do we have time before we cross-examine uh, Brian here? Do we have time for one more question? You think? I've got one from Willen's Law Offices here. I think we can sure. take one more. Okay, so here's what we've got. Uh, Willen's Law Offices. Brian asks you that. Uh, of course, they. Uh, I, I've engaged with uh, this gentleman as well, and uh, active on Google Plus, and I know he does personal injury work. And he writes that he sees a lot of lawyers fairly new out of law school hanging out their shingles without having much practical experience. And uh, he would like to know, do you find that in the criminal law field? 
and how much experience does one need in the criminal law practice before they just go out there and hang out their shingle and for what it's worth I see a lot of that with the Charleston School of Law here in South Carolina tons of new lawyers just sort of graduating and not that there's anything wrong with that but lots in the criminal field as well are you seeing that also in your neck of the woods it's funny, Stephen. I, I, I actually am seeing it more and more. You know, we have a criminal justice center here in Philadelphia where, you know, uh, the vast majority of our criminal practice is done. We do have some stuff out in, in, in the community. But um, I would say five, ten years ago when I was first starting out, you didn't really see young private criminal defense attorneys who were just graduating law school and just hanging out a shingle. But I think that the, the private practice, you know, there was a lot of hiring freezes with public defenders office and district attorney's office when the economy went bad. Um, people, you know, got sour on the, the big firms and, and the money wasn't the same and they were making you work the same amount of hours. And I think, you know, these these you know, there's this entrepreneurial spirit with all the technology and and um, um, you know, Silicon Valley kind of attitude that's popped up around our culture that lawyers are saying, you know what, I, can, I went to law school for three years, I can figure this out, I can get on court appointed lists and start taking court appointed cases and make some money, not have a lot of overhead, and I'll sort of learn, learn on the fly. Now, is it a little dangerous? It's a little dangerous, and, and, and I don't want to go as far as saying irresponsible, but you know, you've got a client whose liberty and freedom is at stake sitting next to you, so you, you want to have some experience, but again, you know, we all had to start somewhere. I mean, someone had to take a chance on us, you know, as a young attorney. You know, I like to think of myself as still relatively, <laughs> relatively young. I mean, if you're asking me personally, I think it would be much better. I think the route I took doing four years as a prosecutor or doing some time in a public defender's office or even working at a firm for a while is the better route to go. Um, but I don't necessarily think that it's a terrible thing. And I, I give these guys, these young men and women, a lot of credit who... Are, are hanging out a shingle. I am seeing it more and more. I just think you need to sort of be careful. Maybe start with some misdemeanor court appointed cases and kind of get your feet wet. Go to a lot of CLEs. Maybe link up with some more experienced attorneys in your area and second chair some cases. Do some work on their cases in the background so that you have that experience and you're not just, you know, you know, putting someone's liberty at stake, you know, without your experience. Yeah, we have, uh, Brian, Tina, a quick question for both of you. We have here in South Carolina implemented, because they are new lawyers from two different law schools in the same state, so we now have a mentoring program that new uh, graduates are required to sort of uh, not le not business-wise partner up with a more experienced attorney, but to meet with another attorney who's been practicing and go over some of these practice issues. You know, there's so much that we don't learn in law school that we don't figure out until we get out into the trenches. Do y'all have, Tina, Brian, do y'all have a mentoring program in your state? Um, we do have a mentoring program. I'm not real familiar with it because it came along after <laughs> I'm kind of showing my age a little bit, but it, it, I didn't have no, to, to you're, participate you're looking, in that. Right. Exact, okay. Uh, I didn't have to participate in it, but we do have one. I guess I have a little bit different view. I feel like I'd rather actually have a brand new lawyer if it was a lawyer who had a low caseload and who, who was smart and who was going to work hard to find out and what was needed in my case and also would I would consider part of that consulting on a mentor basis as much as possible with with practicing attorneys and practicing attorneys are so willing to help uh, that for example I, I handled an immigration case on a pro bono basis completely I had I mean, immigration let me just tell you do you, <laughs> That's don't like go there. To me. It's Holy to be, crap! It's it is, supposed to be really complicated. Yeah, it's, uh, uh -huh. it, it's it's impossible. But I, I probably met with twenty different immigration lawyers when I was when I was representing these two young girls on a pro bono basis, and you know I knew nothing about immigration law, but between extensive study and talking with these lawyers, I feel like I was able to do a good job. And you know, you might get with an experienced lawyer who's handling. You know, it's a big big pet peeve of mine. Or, 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 you know, mill type firms where they're just not looking at the case. I mean, when I say we can look into evidence uh, and, and dig and find evidence, well, that's only if we actually have time to do that. And so if you have a caseload that's too high, but anyway, I, I don't need to get no, on that soapbox. No, but, but it's a but big Tina, issue for me. No, Tina, you make a good point. I mean, there is something about someone who's young and hungry and, and wants to, you know, and like you said, doesn't have a lot of cases and is willing to put everything they've got into your, your case. So there is some, there is a trade-off there. As yeah. far as, as far as, as far mm -hmm. as, um, 
Pennsylvania, I'm not aware of any, I know there's not, as far as I know, any required mentoring program like, uh, Stephen, you were mentioning, um, you know, as far as like a certain amount of hours. I think it's a great idea. I'm not aware of one in Pennsylvania. If there's any Pennsylvania attorneys out there that differ, uh, that are listening, I feel, feel free to comment. I'd love to hear about it. Um, so I don't know about any set up program, but I think it certainly is something that is, if if you are going to, you know, put a shingle out and, and open your own practice, it's something that you you, you want to try to partner up with uh, somebody with uh, some 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 solid experience. And even even as experienced attorneys, if you get into a case that's that's a brand new area to you or a new issue, almost every case brings new issues and and either consulting with other lawyers or co-counseling with other lawyers. It, you know, I'm I'm still learning, and I unfortunately I don't see any end in sight. And now with Google Plus, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and this whole social media thing, but anyway, it's like it's like part of the practice now. But um, yeah, so right. that was uh, a great question. Uh, all right, now we get to a fun part here, Tina. Right? What all are right. we getting ready yeah. to do? Uh, we, you you tell them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, Brian. This is where I have to swear you in because we're calling this segment okay cross examination. Now it's personal. Okay, oh. <laughs> so I need you to raise your right hand, please. I am a notary, by the way. And look at the camera, and do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? I affirm. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is Hell where no. we are going to ask you some questions. Tina's going to lead off here, and you remember, you're sworn to tell the truth. Okay. I'm under, this I'm under is oath. Evidence on Google Plus. So well, Tina. What? Well, one thing I was wondering is um, if, well, let me start with the other one. I, uh, what Brian has, has impressed me with his artistic abilities on, on a couple of occasions <laughs> now. He, he did an amazing pumpkin carving. I mean, I, it's really one of the best I've ever seen. He said he got a kit somewhere, but I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and then he, he also did a, a gingerbread house that looked like it was about half the size of his living room just that he posted recently. So, Brian, I was wondering, what is your next planned uh, big art project? Or do you oh. have one? I, I actually I slept in that gingerbread house that night. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was big enough for you. It looked like it was. Did you really? Yeah, no, I didn't. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I like just put the camera in really <laughs> close. Yeah, it was. It was yeah. sitting on my. It was sitting on my kitchen counter. Um. Oh God. You know. I, Easter. Easter. Easter egg bunny or Easter egg hunt or something. Yeah, I, I wish I, I want to have a creative answer. I, I don't have a, a next art project. To be honest with you, my next art project. Oh, and you have to be honest with us because you're sworn in. <laughs> exactly, so. that's my point. I'm so I, I mean, it, you're probably gonna have to wait until next Halloween to see the next. <laughs> yeah, okay, I got All right. you. All right, all right. So here's my question for you. All right, best all right. James Bond character: Roger Moore, Sean Connery, and why? Which one? Oh. These are t these are tough. I'm not I'm not a 007 guy. I know uh, I could never answer that. I think yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say Connery because I, I don't really know which ones the other guy was even in. <laughs> okay, and, and I gotta say, yeah, there you go. Oh, that's well, a great answer. Okay, that is a perfect answer. That is the best Bond too. Is is Sean Connery? Okay, okay. Tina, I, back to I, you. I would have selected him too because he's the only that's the only name I even write. What was the other name? Uh, Roger Moore. He okay, did, yeah, uh, I've never heard of he him. He did uh, yeah. Moonraker and all these other ones. See, I, this so is my he got the answer knowledge. right. There was yeah, a okay. right answer there. Okay, cool. All right. uh, well, I'm actually wondering, what's your favorite hobby or pastime? I mean, what what keeps you happy when you're not practicing law? What do you do away from the prison? <laughs> <laughs> When every you're not time, in prison. Yes. Yeah, every, yes. Every time I get parole, the first thing I do. No, I... I <laughs> It my 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 favorite hobby um, before my children came along because they are now my favorite hobby um, because when I go home ninety nine percent of my attention is with my children I've got a six year old boy Billy and an eight year old daughter Amelia and they are uh, really everything to me I'm I'm, a, I'm a, as Tina knows a real family man Jason Dunkel who's watching knows that as well he, I know he's got beautiful twins and, and another. Uh, child, he's got three kids. So, so I spend a lot of times with my kids doing Legos, drawing, whatever it is. But, but personally, um, I love um, the, I love to play the, the acoustic guitar. Uh, I'm not very good at I'm not very good at it. Oh, it's something that I picked up in college. Uh, you know, when like Fish and the Dead, and it was cool to play the guitar. And I thought I would get girls, so I you know <laughs> I, I figured if I learned how to play like. The, 
I figured if I learned how to play the Indigo Girls closer to fine, I could maybe get get some girls. Um, and, so, and you just admitted to playing the Indigo Girls on the yes, I did. Yes. So, <laughs> see, this is why I like cross examination. Good. Yeah, one. So, so, so oh. the, guitar, the guitar is a nice, like Zen kind of relax, relaxing place. Unfortunately, I don't get a ton of time to do it. I also enjoy reading and I and I enjoy hiking and things of that nature, skiing. So, so those are some of my hobbies. All right. Cool. I, uh, so the next one I have for you is your most embarrassing moment as a lawyer. Uh, you know, it could be in the courtroom, could be in the office. Uh, you know, if you cut wind at counsel table, whatever the most embarrassing. Oh, come on. Hey, uh, listen, I, I'm sorry. It's it's personal. <laughs> Believe me, That's that has personal. happened before, not to me, uh, but all yeah, right. it, oh, oh yeah, I've seen <laughs> some weird stuff in the courtroom. Do not eat broccoli for lunch. Uh, no no uh, broccoli. Yeah. Broccoli and beans, <laughs> great combination. <laughs> all right, so Brian, uh, most embarrassing well, moment. Uh, okay. <laughs> I asked. I asked an inane question. That's how we got here. Since since since, I'm, since I am under oath, yes. I will I will admit that at my last. This is not the embarrassing moment, by the way, which is scary. But uh, uh, avoid I, the question. This is a good technique. No, I'll say this. I, I no no. I'm gonna say exactly. Is he gonna what spin it said. on us, Tina? Is he no no no? no. I'm okay. about to get to the cross exam. I'm about to throw myself under the bus. All right. No one really heard it, but at my last jury trial, I did pass wind a little bit at the council. I see. <laughs> I'm telling you, it oh happens. My God. <laughs> there you go. You I'm, heard I'm, it live. This is not right a male-only show. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm leaning. Right I'm, le I'm leaning forward. I'm cross-examining. I'm, you know, I'm all like loose. I, I didn't mean to. So anyway, I, that's, I don't know. That's, uh, 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 that was. I don't know. Share. Okay, yeah. Tina, why don't you okay. ask him a hard-hitting question? Let me question. get into something yeah. a little bit sweeter yeah. and nicer. Uh, okay, and one question I had was, if you were, if you would, if you had to choose a second career, what would it be and why? I guess maybe acoustic guitarist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, right. If I mean, if I had, if I had my choice of anything, or like realistically. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I had seriously, to choose, I, I really wonder that because I think it tells you something about someone that what they would maybe do if they weren't doing this. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. My wife is a teacher. Um, and she absolutely loves her job. She's a Spanish teacher, and she finds it extremely fulfilling. Um, she, she, we live in the neighborhood where she teaches, so she has her students come like on, on Halloween. They love the trick or treat. Oh, it's Miss Fishman's house. It's Miss Fishman's house. You know, they're like so excited and stuff like that. And I see how much she's touched these kids and how they come back to visit her year after year. She even has like seven or eight students who have become Spanish teachers that were students of hers. So. Um, I also love the idea of being done work at 3.30 in the afternoon and being able to be home for my kids when they get off the school bus, um, having your summers off. So I think that I, in another lifetime, if I came back, I think being a teacher would be a pretty awesome job. Wow, I think you'd be great at that too, just having gotten to know you a little bit. You'd be great. So, And, and I know you love your kids. So, And your students wouldn't mind mm -hmm. you passing gas there. <laughs> oh, no. as a, you know, they're kids. It's going to happen, right? Stephen, you're not going to let me can, live this can down. Can we never you? speak no. of this again? No, I, mean, no. I can't believe this even happened. All right. So okay. uh, I think if it's okay, one more question here for him. And this is probably true of everybody. Uh, Tina, if I were going to swear you in. Uh, Brian, what is your New Year's resolution? Oh, good question. Well, as, as you both know, and a lot of my friends on Google Plus are just sort of learning, is I just started my own law practice. Woo -hoo! Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you. So, <laughs> so after four... It's, I just wanted to give Stephen a reason to push some buttons on Google. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so after four years of, of being a district attorney and after eight years of working mm -hmm. under another individual, I have now hung out my own shingle. Uh, it is the Fishman Firm, LLC, uh, here in Philadelphia. And um, obviously, you know, your first resolutions would go without saying, you know, health and, uh, and happiness for, for your family and, and things of that nature. But I'm really looking forward to 2014 because, you know, this will be the inaugural year of, of the Fishman Firm, and I'm looking forward to um, a really exciting year. So my resolution is to, 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 to pour my heart and soul into my, my new baby and to uh, hopefully, you know, feed it with water and give it sunshine and, and watch it grow. 
Yeah. And, I, and, and I'm counting on all you Google Plus friends of mine out there to, uh, to help me along the way. Absolutely. Everyone support. needs to do extra sharing of, of Brian, any current new blog posts from Brian because yeah, he's and, trying and, to and get and this I, thing I, off I, the ground. I don't know if she's watching because she's in San Diego, but I want to give a quick shout out to, um, I don't know, you guys are probably connected with her, Kamisha Morris of, mm -hmm. San, of San Diego Esquire. She is awesome. She has assisted me with some blog posting. She's given me some great advice on social media marketing. I'm on her newsletter, which I get whenever she uh, posts new posts. I get it in my email. I highly recommend everyone check out San Diego Esquire and Kamisha Morris. Um, she has been awesome. Um, and I know Stacy Washington, an attorney in Ann Arbor, Michigan, has recently uh, teamed up with her and, and, is, and is doing some work with her. So, uh, you know, there's some really great attorneys out there. And, and I really, uh, I got an email, a personal email from Jeffrey La Lapine. I thought it was Lapin. Uh, I got uh, an email from him yesterday congratulating me. You know, off air, a lot of us don't talk, but it was really nice of him, I thought, on a on a Sunday to reach out and shoot me an email congratulating me, giving me some, a few tips, letting me know, uh, you know if I need any help to call him up or email him. So uh, I, I don't, I honestly, a year ago without Google Plus, I don't know that I would have had the courage to take this step. So I thank all of you. That's and, awesome. And this, is, this, this has really been a great reason why I feel confident in doing this. Yeah. Well, listen, we have, Tina, I, I'm sure I can speak for both of us when we say we have so very much enjoyed having you as our first guest. We had planned this for a 15-minute segment. We've gone to an hour, so Sorry. we may... Hopefully, no, no, listen, we, don't I think apologize. we may need to learn how to rein it in a little bit. I don't uh, know, but may, hopefully people... Maybe we'll just it. make it an it hour. It's wonderful. Yeah. I, well, I we'll knew. see. I know I know the way I talk, this was never gonna be fifteen minutes. Yeah. I knew. <laughs> we are lawyers after all, right? Yeah. This is true. So yeah. um, oh, can I just I just wanted also do a shout out to um a, a couple of people I like. I, Les Doss, I mean just I don't want them to feel left out. Les Dossy, he's taken a few weeks off, but he's a life coach and we're hoping to have him on in the future. Also our next guest is gonna be Ron Miller, who's a Maryland personal injury attorney, and I think he is just just a top-notch lawyer. I can't wait to see Jeffrey Jeffrey Lapine. Um, he does give me a hard time quite often on Google Plus, but it's <laughs> yes, always he does. he does he does. But I think I bring it out in him, so I take a lot of pride in that. I can't tell if you guys are flirting or if actually there's, <laughs> oh, there's like on. I I stay out of it. No, I go there's... back and forth, and I go. I'm like, okay, I'm like a warrior. Yeah, just I just them. I just yeah. watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think he he just, anyway. He's yeah. he's a great guy. He he. Every once in a while, he becomes very authentic and, and says something that just touches my heart. And so I do actually think a lot of Jeffrey Lapin. Uh, or I see, I say Jeffrey Lapin too. I Jeff, don't Jeff, remember what Jeff, his actual Jeff, name is. Jeff, we're just going to call you Lapin. We I can't, don't know. Yeah, we yeah. just can't stand it. And and also yeah. want to say hello to Lori Robbins, who's who's taken part in a lot of our. I mean, there have been there have been so many people. It'd be impossible to mention everyone, but but we're just hoping to get as many uh, good lawyers and those who, who help them featured on here and, and hopefully people are interested in hearing from lawyers and talking about the law. So. Yeah. And Ron Miller was another one of those guys from the, my original group I, I left out but I mean again I left I know I left out a bunch but he, right. he's, he, he's awesome so everyone should tune in for him because he's, he's a great guy. All right, guys. Well, I don't know about y'all, but my blood sugar is getting lower. <laughs> or, or I need another All cup right. of coffee. Uh, listen, Brian, again, thank you so much for being our guinea pig, for doing this first show. This has been a lot of fun. Tina. You were uh, awesome. I, I, hey, you rock. You know I love thank you. you. And, and uh, so y'all have been watching live, or you'll catch it later. This is... Um, this is Legally Speaking. We're hoping to do this on a weekly basis. Remember, we're all lawyers, so nothing goes off without a hitch. But if all goes well, we'll have a regularly featured guest each and every week throughout the coming weeks. We're going to take a quick break after January. We're going to skip January 6th, but then we'll resume on Mondays at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I'm excited to say we're picking up uh, we picked up a sponsor before we even had our first podcast. Yay! Yes. We have a sponsor coming up, and uh, I'll go ahead and yay! Yeah, that was a good yeah. time. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll go ahead and give a shout out to Rocket X One from Rocket Matter, which is uh, uh, for those of y'all not familiar with it, is a wonderful litigation uh, uh, online cloud-based practice management program. I'm sure a lot of y'all have heard of it. Some uh, I know a lot of you use it as well. So thank you, the folks from Rocket Matter. We'll see you all in January. And everybody, if you will say goodbye to the camera, Brian. 
Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. And uh, everybody have a great new year. I wish everybody health and happiness 2014. Yeah. Yes. Tina? Yes, thank you. I really had a lot of fun. And happy new year to everyone. Happy new year, everyone. <laughs> and we'll see you again.